what is the state of America's health? We're in some trouble in 2021 in terms of America's health. Uh, the obvious big factor is the last year of dealing with the pandemic and the coronavirus. Never before is it more obvious that the rising rates of obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, inactivity matter terribly. We used to worry predominantly about heart disease and cancer, which uh, develop maybe 10 to 20 years after a period of poor lifestyle choices, poor environment, poor access to healthy food. But now we don't have to wait 10 or 20 years. We can get a virus that can put us in an intensive care unit and kill hundreds of thousands of us. So never before should there be a unified, really primal screen that there should be as much effort to build a wall and build healthy grocery stores and build access to walking paths and uh, ban vending machines and fast food restaurants and uh, poor quality processed foods, but we have to substitute and find a way. You think about literally the trillions of dollars we've spent in the last 12 months in this country. And almost not a nickel of it is actually getting to make America healthier so that they are more resistant, more resilient to the virus. So we need a unified scream. You know, we're broken. We've gone down a bad path since fast food restaurants popped up and big uh, food companies have dominated the scene. And we got to take our health back or we won't be as many of us. And that's happening rapidly. A recent study claimed vegans have more bone fractures. Is this true? Well, I am in my 44th year of eating a whole food plant-based diet. I am in my 31st year of cardiology practice. I mean, I'm real about this topic. It's a wonderful choice for the environment to be vegan. It's a wonderful choice for the animals to be vegan. And for the humans, you have to do it a little carefully and not uh, without some planning. And the planning is to emphasize whole food plant-based, not processed, not junk, not fast vegan food. They can be a tiny treat once in a while, but pretty rare. Uh, and the other is to be knowledgeable that there are some nutrients that are deficient in a meat diet. There are nutrients deficient in an Asian diet. There are nutrients deficient in the Mediterranean diet. And there can be nutrients deficient in a version of even a healthy whole food plant-based diet. So getting enough vitamin D, whether you're just eating a lot of mushrooms or fortified foods, getting enough vitamin K2, very important for bone health, very difficult to get with just plants unless you're eating natto or natto soybeans, which are available, but they're just not talked about much. Or you supplement uh, and you supplement uh, by intelligently picking a vegan multivitamin that might provide some of these bone supportive and bone friendly activities and uh, nutrients, uh, or you just one by one read a little bit and fill them in. So I think we take a amazingly good diet and make it a little safer and better with some supplementation. Not every vegan medical doctor agrees with that. They think it sort of denigrates the argument that this is a great path for overall health, uh, but I don't. I think it's just better when you measure, replace, and optimize. Uh, you know, bone health is also about physical fitness. And sometimes in the vegan movement, we don't talk a lot about weight bearing exercise, wearing weighted vests for bone health, um, you know, stretching, yoga, a lot of body activity to uh, keep your bones healthiest. So yes, there is, you know, mixed data. The most recent study raised a bit of a concern these are database studies. These are observational studies. They all have their structural weakness to them, but we should be a little concerned. And I advise patients, build strong bones, take at least vitamin D3 and vitamin K2 as a combination with your whole food plant-based diet. Can we really prevent heart attacks and strokes with diet and lifestyle? Yeah, there's no question we can prevent heart attacks and strokes with lifestyle. Even with less than a complete whole food plant-based diet, there's pretty compelling data in the last decade that 85% of heart attacks and strokes can be avoided by five simple steps. And these come from research studies. Don't smoke, walk 30 minutes a day, eat more than five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, get seven to eight hours of sleep at night, not four to five, 
And actually, although I don't encourage you to do this, drinking a glass of wine a day comes through these science studies as a consistent, uh, supportive, heart-friendly activity to lower the risk of heart attack. Now, I don't think 85% reduction in heart disease is enough, and I'm an aggressive cardiologist. I want 100% reduction in stroke and heart attack. So I add in on top of your lifestyle, on top of your whole food plant-based diet, you should get a heart calcium CT screening scan done. Most communities that cost about 75 to $100. Some communities it's free. Some communities still charge more. You often need a doctor's prescription. It's a 10 second CT scan of the heart, heart calcium CT scan. Uh, most people aren't whole food plant-based for 44 years like I am. Most people are for six months, six years, and there may be some serious heart disease already that they're carrying around, or there may be non-food related reasons for heart disease and stroke risk like genetic inputs. And the other thing is to get some extra blood tests. Don't be a whole food plant-based eater and don't go to the doctor or order your own blood test, but certainly know your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your blood sugar, know your homocysteine level. It's possible if you're low in vitamin B12, your homocysteine level is elevated. That's bad for your arteries. It's bad for your sexual health, bad for your brain health. Know what your lipoprotein little a, that's a form of cholesterol that's genetic. I have patients that are perfect whole food plant-based eaters and they've had a heart attack because of a genetic cholesterol called lipoprotein little a. So you have to go in eyes wide open. It doesn't mean the diet isn't amazing. It means that diet isn't the only factor that prevents heart attacks and strokes. It's a very important one. Obviously smoking, fitness, a good sleep, stress management are the routine lifestyle measures, but there's even more advanced ways. I think we can really, really reach close to 100% stroke and heart attack prevention with lifestyle plus some simple, inexpensive, this isn't an elite program. It's inexpensive to get a heart calcium CT scan. It's expensive to have a heart attack. So it's much better to be up front around age 40, 45 and start checking your heart periodically. Do you recommend bariatric surgery? Uh, I have not had a reason to recommend bariatric surgery in years and years. I do have some associates that are in town and are very good at it. Um, one of them that I tend to refer to has actually written a book about whole food plant-based eating. Uh, it's called A Pound of Vegetables a Day, I think. So I like to refer to him because uh, the patients might hear more than just me about lifestyle and diet and attempting to move forward. Yet, obesity is a horrendous and horrific problem. It's not about shape or shaming. It's just about diabetes and joint disease and heart disease and dementia um, and cholesterol and blood pressure and early death. Um, so the attack isn't only with optimal diets. We have recent data uh, that even more profoundly show that the best plan to lose weight is a whole food, plant-based, naturally low-fat diet, even superior to a Mediterranean diet for healthy bodies, healthy weight loss. But if you're 150 pounds overweight, it just simply may not do it. You may have to address uh, abnormal sleep patterns, trauma, psychological issues, stress, emotional issues in your life, and you may need more. Now, there are some new and interesting diabetic medicines that are leading to rather significant weight loss. They're expensive therapies, but at least they're just a weekly injection. Um, surgery's a much bigger deal and you know, isn't easy to undo. So I would put surgery you know, very far down the road, but I wouldn't put it off the table if somebody's suffering the consequences of obesity um, and just can't find a path to deal with it. And I feel for those people that are trying, but just don't see the results. When, excuse me, when do you recommend people get heart surgery and when can you instead use diet and lifestyle? Are there times when heart disease is too advanced to treat with diet and lifestyle? Yeah, so the pioneers in this field and always got to give credit to Mr. Nathan Pritikin, to Dr. Dean Ornish, to Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, that bravely, and I mean that, it's difficult. I do that in my clinic to take a patient with seriously blocked arteries and symptoms and talk to them that they may actually have the opportunity or choice to say to their surgeon or say to their 
invasive cardiologist, I don't want that procedure. I'm going to follow a path that has, you know, 30, 40 years of scientific support, 50 years, publications, insurance approval. It's tough. It's very stressful for patients to try and take a different path. And even if I'm there for them, supporting them, counseling them, giving them the medical data, but never before than now, do we have uh, massive support for the idea that the majority of people being told they need bypass or stents don't need it. And that's a very bold statement. And that came, of course, out of some of the experience of Dr. Ornish, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Joel Furman, all of whom have worked with seriously sick heart patients and seen good results. But there's now mainstream massive data. There was in 2020, a research study published called the ischemia study. It was the most expensive cardiology research study ever done. You're really having bad problems with angina pain. You flunked your stress test. You're seriously a heart patient, but you were randomized. You go quickly to bypass or stent, or you get on medicine, a low saturated fat diet, and a fitness program. Completely different paths. You would think for sure stenting and bypass was superior. Nope. Exactly the same outcome at three and a half years exactly the same risk. People die from bypass surgery. People have strokes from bypass surgery. People have infections from bypass surgery and stent procedures, even though I'm a trained and very experienced stent cardiologist. And if the research says you can do as well with fitness, medication, and a low saturated fat diet, let alone they learn about whole food plant-based advantages, why are we having so many people undergo these operations and procedures? And a significant number of them having complications. We just have to redo the whole medical system and stress. Bypass should be the last thing you do, just like bariatric surgery and uh, advanced stenting should similarly be unless you're in a real emergency crisis. Unfortunately, patients don't hear that unless they really seek out. It's not a holistic opinion. It's actually the most uh, appropriate scientific recommendation. So I actually spend a fair amount of my time in my clinic educating, and influencing patients to be strong enough to say to their doctor, I want to hold off. I want to try cardiac rehabilitation, maybe the Pritikin, maybe the Ornish version. I want to watch Forks Over Knives. I want to you know, watch the real uh, Truth About Health conference. I want to get some information. And if I don't do well with it, we can do the invasive procedures later on. What should a man or woman do if a mammogram, MRI, or other diagnostic test finds something in their body that could possibly be uh, malignant? Should they biopsy it? Should they remove it? Should they treat with mainstream protocols? Should they consider alternative protocols? Yeah, I think I'm frankly going to sidestep that question. Um, I'm not an oncologist. I don't treat cancer. I've got enough on my plate teaching people what to put on their plate for cardiovascular disease and general wellness and aging support. Um, it's a very tough issue and I don't want to give, uh, you know, other than a quality answer. So you know, they all need to eat well and get fitness and get sleep and not smoke and maybe have some advanced labs or nutritional assessment. But um, I do encourage cancer patients to seek somebody out that can help support them from a natural standpoint, even if they're getting radiation and chemotherapy. There are doctors that do it. There are naturopathic doctors, NDs that do it. Some in my community are board certified naturopathic doctors in oncology. So they don't substitute, they don't give chemotherapy, they don't write for radiation therapy. They often work closely with the oncologist, but they're gonna emphasize more the sleep, the stress, the nutrition, the minimization of side effects from therapy. Um, there is a specialty that has basically exploded in the last 10 years called cardio-oncology, the overlap of heart disease and cancer therapy. Many cancer patients die of heart disease. Could be the treatment, the chemotherapy, the radiation. Could be just, uh, you're very likely to have heart disease if you're a cancer patient you know, in an adult age range. So, uh, this is a recognition that if we're looking for really the best long-term approach, we have to broaden our support of supporting the, the circulatory system. You know, men with prostate cancer, they get Lupron, the anti-androgen, anti-testosterone therapy. 
they raise their risk of dying of heart disease. So we have to watch that. We have to test for it. We have to watch the blood sugar, the cholesterol, the blood pressure, uh, maybe do calcium scans, stress tests, what we need to do. But we don't want to have a victory in the prostate and a uh, statistic in terms of heart. So it's a complex field, but there definitely is a role for nutritional support. What impact does a whole food plant-based diet have on cholesterol and does high cholesterol correlate with heart attacks and deaths? Well, there's no question in the world of epidemiology and statistics that your blood cholesterol does correlate strongly with your risk of heart death. We learned this decades ago, maybe most uh, famously from a research study called the Seven Countries Study uh, that was masterminded by Ansel Keys, PhD, and 17 or 18 other world famous epidemiologists, scientists, and cardiologists from Harvard to Italy to Japan. And there was a very strong line, the average blood cholesterol in the community and the rate of dying of heart disease over 10 years, 20 years. They actually followed people up to 50 years in this famous study. There's no question, it can't be argued otherwise. But statistics always allow outliers. You can have a high cholesterol and not have a heart death, and you could have a low cholesterol and have a heart death because there are other factors. Cholesterol is a risk factor. It's not the risk factor. It's one of the risk factors. A low cholesterol in a smoker, you may still have heart disease and even die of it. Um, a whole food plant-based diet scientifically is most likely to lower your cholesterol maximally, particularly if you approach it with the low percentage of fat calories that you're going to have if you're eating fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains without added uh, margarines and oils and um, imitation meats and cheeses, real clean diets. But there is variability. There are people that make a lot of cholesterol independent of their diet. They are called hyper producers and they will be amongst a fairly large group of whole food plant-based eaters that are frustrated. And I get these Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, email, and office visits, you know, every week. Dr. Khan, I live in Vancouver and my cholesterol is 236, but I'm eating a no SOS, no salt, oil, sugar, whole food, plant-based diet. What's up? Well, if you're really doing that, and you can certainly uh, engage me from Vancouver with a telehealth visit, we can go through, you know, meal by meal by meal by other factors. You can actually test. And there are people that are just hyper producers. And if they have cardiovascular disease, they may need supplements or medication beyond the diet. But certainly the uh, first place award goes to whole food plant-based diets for lowering blood cholesterol. How many large unbiased studies are done on health, diet, and lifestyle? How many favor a whole food organic plant-based diet and how many favor a low carb diet? A bias is difficult because bias is in the eye of the beholder. Um, I, you know, everybody has a bias. Um, when Dr. Neil Barnard publishes a hugely important randomized study of two different nutritional paths, he gets attacked. You're a vegan doctor. Well, I mean, it's gone through the institutional review board panel to get permission to experiment on humans. It's gone through the scientific review boards. It's gone through the journal publication review piles, and it gets published. And um, you know, with all that, all those people touching the data that aren't necessarily sharing the same dietary pattern as Dr. Neil Bernard, just to pick out one uh, plant-based doctor that does publish a lot of high quality data, um, the bias can be put aside. This is just science. Of course, Dr. Barnard and others that are doing research are more interested in the topic because they've got skin in the game. They've seen the results, they follow the lifestyle, they have a clinic where they manage people and see the results, and they strive to ask the question, what I see in my clinic, can we reproduce in a research trial? And lo and behold, uh, boom, boom, series of studies, you can document that this isn't just in Washington, D.C. This is human body and human physiology. So. Um, nutrition science to actually do the best kind, prospective, randomized studies. You eat this way for eight weeks or 16 weeks. You eat this way for eight weeks or 16 weeks, and we're going to support you with education and dietitians and 
Sometimes they actually give them the meals to even ensure a higher level of compliance. They're tough to do, they're expensive to do. There's people that drop out all the time because they just uh, get frustrated or the schedule. Yet we've had in the last 12 months, a lot of those studies and it's been headline after headline after headline supporting whole food plant-based diets compared to keto diets. Whoa, you know, it's actually, we seem to lose fat in our waistline and in our viscera quicker than the ketogenic diet, so popular but it's been basically dismantled by an NIH researcher who has shown carefully that uh, whole food plant-based diets, high in carbohydrates from plants, low in fat, no animals do very well with weight loss and superior to ketogenic diets. And even compared to the well uh, acclaimed Mediterranean diet, there's data now that a naturally low fat whole food plant-based diet accelerates weight loss, improves cholesterol, blood sugar, insulin, sensitivity better than even the Mediterranean diet. So yeah, it's been a really good year to gain further support to the idea that plants over meat is a really good plan. Of all the people you've advised over the last 30 years, who followed your advice? What were the results? What percent got to their optimal blood sugar, blood pressure, and weight? What percent reversed major health issues? And what percent didn't get the expected results? Yeah, the smart ones followed my advice. So all you smart people out there, pat yourself on the back. You know, it's an interesting thing because I pretty much go through the same process with everybody. You know, by the next visit, I want you to watch Forks Over Knives, What the Health, The Game Changers. Here's a book to read. Maybe here's a podcast to listen to. It depends what they tell me is their best method of education because some people are just not readers and they'd rather watch or they'd rather listen. And... I'm always blown away by the segment, I'll call it 75%, just estimate, that actually on the next visit have done all that. <laughs> and, and sometimes the statement comes, I'm fully, it's usually I'm fully vegan now. If they're really in the game, I'm fully whole food plant-based now. And it might only be six weeks later and I dropped eight pounds and I feel better and my sleep is better and my skin is better. I always respect people that actually listened and actually uh, made changes. And sometimes there's a spouse, there's children, there's a job that could be an impediment, but they're doing it anyways. They've seen the value of all that. There are people that should do it that just have a series of excuses and roadblocks. Um, they may actually still be stopping at McDonald's and Burger King. And I, I just have to scratch my head. And it's not an economic thing. These are people that um, aren't eating at McDonald's because it's a couple of dollars cheaper than the salad bar. They're eating there out of food addictions and habit. Um, I really try and help them uh, get better food. It might be that there's a chef in town that delivers. It might be there's one of these uh, regional or national services that might deliver whole food plant-based uh, meals, even if they do it for one week. So the expense is pretty minimal just to you really immerse into it. But is it 100% effective? We're trying to get weight loss, blood pressure control, blood sugar control, it isn't. Um, when you talk to even going through a two to three week water fast, maybe 80% of people hit that goal a lot of people want. I'd like to see if I get off medication or have a substantial reduction in medication. Even with something as drastic, and intense as an inpatient water fast, like you might get at True North. It's not 100%. So we're not gonna be anywhere better than that with office and outpatient approaches uh, that are a little gentler than a water fast, but it's well more than half the people will see a substantial difference. Um, and again, some of them, it's just truly miraculous. There are people that get off medication, people that hit their target weight, people that see their numbers just fall into the normal range without medication, solely because they threw the old diet away and they, without questions asked, adopted the proven whole food plant-based diet. Should we, should we try to add or avoid salt in our diet? How big a problem is salt? What health problems does it cause? And why do some people say we need salt? When you listen to patients, there's variability, but when they get off track, when they go back 
as some do over the holidays or family events and there's chips and there's processed food and there's too many breads because many store-bought breads are high in salt or they go back to eating a little chicken and there's a lot of chicken that's actually injected with sodium to plump it up and give it more weight at the butcher shop or the grocery store but it gives more salt to the uh, the purchaser, um, you can hear from them. You know, my blood pressure was up. I feel puffy. My ankle swelled up. So there are clearly salt sensitive individuals. Um, and we know from studying natural populations and tribes and communities that we can exist with very little salt, three, four, 500 milligrams a day and have very good health and longevity like Okinawa, like the um, tribes in Mexico that have been studied, uh, you know, a naturally low salt diet, which if you're eating fruit, vegetables, peas, beans, um, whole grains that you prepare on your own, if you're using lots of spices, but not salt spices, you will have a very naturally low salt diet and favor, you know, achieving good blood pressure. Blood pressure is a huge problem, high blood pressure. It kills people, it kills kidneys, it kills brains, it kills heart, it kills sexual organs. And if you can improve your blood pressure by lowering the salt in your diet, excellent. There is always going to be a small contrary group. There is the group. There's an occasional book out there about the importance of salt, maybe Himalayan salt or Celtic salt with more minerals. But the excess sodium still is at risk for raising people's blood pressure. Um, the only thing we've sacrificed by lowering the salt in our diet uh, is that we've lowered the amount of iodine intake in our food because it used to be iodinized salt was a common item in our kitchen. And the iodine was added for a reason to prevent goiters and thyroid disease. So I do check iodine, actually urine levels in all my patients. And a substantial number are very low and they could be whole food plant-based eaters and they need to add back sources of iodine. Uh, could be sea vegetables, kelp, seaweed, um, they may add back, if they're not having blood pressure problem, a little eighth of a teaspoon of iodinized salt in their soup. Um, you can get a whole food plant-based multivitamin with iodine in it just to replace that. Iodine is important for breast health, thyroid health, cholesterol health, overall body functioning. But um, no, go low salt is always a better choice. You can always add in as opposed to cooking. Last statement, as a cardiologist that has owned up to three restaurants at one point, it's currently one, um, traditional line cooks love salt. I mean, it's just gonna be a crowd pleaser that there is a bit of a salty taste to a soup, to a stew, to a chili. And you know, I had to go in the kitchen and basically slap salt out of chef's hands and say, we can always let people add the salt in, but people don't want bland food. So there is still that cultural fight going on. There is a lot of press about choline and the importance of consuming eggs to get enough of this nutrient. Can vegans get sufficient choline? Yeah, choline, it's, an, it's still, I think, an unresolved topic. It's a nutrient. It is found in egg yolk. Um, it is found in plant-based foods. There's a downside to choline we've learned in the last 10 years because there's a blood product or a metabolite is called, called TMAO, four letters, trimethylamine and oxide or TMAO. And if you ingest supplements with choline, Cleveland Clinic research shows, you can drive your gut and your liver to make more TMAO. And TMAO may be very bad for blood vessels and kidneys. It's been in now over a thousand research studies shown to be associated with early death, early heart disease, brain disease, heart failure, kidney failure. Um, so there's a mixed bag for taking a multivitamin or a brain vitamin that has choline in it. And in the functional medicine world, this is very, very common. Um, uh, but yet you need some, you know, there's a lot in medicine. Too little could be a deficiency, too much is an excess, and there's a sweet spot. Uh, whole food plant-based eaters will get choline in their food. Uh, I have written on this, and I believe soybeans have an equivalent amount of choline as egg yolk and dried soybeans can be a very delicious crunchy snack. Edamame can be a very delicious side dish or main course, throw them in the salad, throw them in the soup. So I would get my choline from whole food plants. Uh, we don't generally check levels. There are a few advanced ways to do it. 
Um, you can check the TMAO level. I will simply say if you're eating a lot of choline rich foods, egg yolk, or if you're taking supplements with choline, phosphatidylcholine, I would want to see your TMAO level. If it's normal, it's working for you. If it's sky high, you might want to reassess and cut back. Why do you recommend vitamin D supplements? Yeah, never before the current era has there been so much focus on vitamin D because of the pandemic. And at least the suggestion, if you were to contact COVID with a moderate or high vitamin D level, you're likely to go through the illness easier and with less severity than if you're severely deficient. And there's a lot of people in the uh, world severely deficient in vitamin D. Of course, it's a simple, inexpensive blood test. If you want to know if you're deficient or sufficient, you either send your own blood off or get your doctor to check your vitamin D level. It's still not routine for primary care docs to check vitamin D levels, but ask for it and they'll add it on. Um, so there is some impact on our immune system. Uh, there's not going to be that I know of a randomized study with coronavirus and vitamin D. There's just too many experts, including Dr. Fauci and somebody I actually put a little more weight on, a Dr. Paul Merrick at East Virginia Medical School um, that has been writing about the importance of vitamin D for uh, immune function for a long time and has done serious ICU studies on vitamin D and vitamin C. Uh, otherwise, vitamin D is important for bone health. We know that may be combined with vitamin K2. Um, you can get all the vitamin D you need from your food. You can confirm that with a blood test. Mushrooms are very rich in vitamin D. You might have to eat a lot of them every day to really get a good vitamin D blood level, but you can do it. Some of the fortified plant milks have vitamin D in them. That's a great way to get it. Some of the general multivitamins or specifically plant-based multivitamins have vitamin D and some vitamin D is vegan and some isn't. If you're buying a supplement, you might wanna choose one that's labeled vegan vitamin D3. That wasn't so available 10 years ago. It's very available. And vitamin D is very inexpensive. It's pennies a day to take 2000 international units a day. Or in my clinic, everybody takes 5000 international units a day. And then I repeat a blood test, but it's never excessive. And sometimes it's actually not adequate, even though that's considered generally a pretty FD dose. So, um, you know, is there a downside people with kidney stones? We don't think vitamin D leads to calcification of heart arteries, but there's still things to learn. Should pregnant women take DHA? Are supplemental DHA and EPA recommended for others? Yeah, I'd like them to get it from food. I don't manage pregnant women. Um, I can't actually remember the last time I had a pregnant woman as a patient, but um, because of the developing brain of the fetus, uh, I will say that omega-3 deficiency is the most common deficiency in my clinic. And I check 15 vitamin levels on thousands of patients every year. Um, omega-3 is the number one most common deficiency. Uh, people you know, are eating fish that don't have rich omega-3 because there's really only sardines and mackerel and anchovies and herring and crab salmon, uh, or people aren't eating in the whole food plant-based world, uh, chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp parts, so they're not converting much over to EPA, DHA. So it, again, um, isn't routine, but it's easily available and not expensive to get an omega-3 blood level. And I would want moms to focus on natural sources of omega-3, walnuts, leafy greens, uh, chia, hemp, flax, every day, one or two tablespoons, um, and uh, probably not need to supplement, but there's certainly no harm uh, that I would find. I'd rather they take a good quality algal omega-3 than risk uh, the developing brain or their own health. What nutritional supplements do you recommend we all take? Uh, you know, in the whole food plant-based world, most would agree that B12 should be routine. There are people that have very good vitamin B12 levels without taking supplements. Um, sometimes nori has B12, uh, nutritional yeast has B12. There's an interesting new green vegetable that I've been using called mankai, M-A-N-K-I-I, that makes B12 as a plant, very unusual, and it's available now. 
sort of a super green food in a smoothie. Um, and if you're doing that route, just get a blood test. It's, you know, uh, it, it's embarrassing, frankly, to be a vegan and have vitamin B12 deficiency because everybody knows it, everybody talks about it, and it's going to affect your blood counts, your brain, um, maybe raise your homocysteine level and affect your heart arteries. Um, beyond that, there's not total agreement. I recommend testing and supplementation, and I love uh, a couple brands of multivitamins for vegans that are out there that are easy solution in one capsule. You're getting D, B12, algal omega-3, a little iodine we you know think is necessary for health, a little selenium, which is an antioxidant mineral that is in Brazil nuts, but not everybody eats Brazil nuts, uh, a little um, magnesium, which can help with blood pressure and skip beats. So it's a one-stop shop to get sort of a cutting edge, plant-based multivitamin. And I find many of the patients who've done that and then I recheck their blood work, it's, it's just a simple method rather than seven different bottles and their blood tests come back very pleasing. What's wrong with yogurt? Don't we need probiotics? Well, yogurt isn't exclusive to the non-plant-based eaters. Fortunately, now there's a lot of fermented foods that are plant-based. Of course, always kimchi, sauerkraut, and any pickled vegetables you want to make have long been available. Um, they are super rich in living cultures and probiotics. But now you know, the replacement for the dairy-based uh, foods like yogurt, like lassi, like labna, uh, there is absolutely amazing um, Pro, uh, yogurts from oat milk. That's my favorite right now. Unflavored, unsweetened, you know, it's seriously yogurt flavor, but they are refrigerated and they have living cultures. So we should not have any problem reaching for them. I mean, if you stand back and say, does every research study find fermented dairy to be dangerous? It's not true. There are a number of studies that identify fermented cow dairy products like yogurt as being heart friendly. I can't say that's bad science. I just choose to get it from the widely available and very flavorful whole food plant-based options. And that way I don't have to deal with my patients with the 50 to 90% that are lactose intolerant uh, with those that are having acne or stomach uh, gurgling from dairy because now there are you know really good sources that are naturally low in fat, which many of the heart patients want and are just flavorful. What's wrong with cheese? Don't we need calcium? We need calcium in our diet. We don't need to depend on dairy products to get it. They carry calcium along with the salt, along with the lactose that a lot of people are intolerant of, along with the saturated fat that will raise cholesterol, uh, the amount of cheese the average American eats has just skyrocketed in the last 50 years, 100 years. And it's actually encouraged by our government through food subsidies and the checkmark program. There's no question why there's so many fast food places that have cheese on every single item because they're inexpensive. And sometimes even the advertising is paid for by our tax dollars. It's absolutely heinous or heinous. Uh, it is really a bad method. And we can easily get all the calcium we need through leafy greens, uh, nuts and seeds, um, some of the plant uh, milk and plant food options like the plant yogurts that have calcium in them. But particularly some superstars like uh, rhubarb and Swiss chard and kale and mustard greens, and, uh, turnip greens and beetroots and you know, you add some uh, leafies in your diet, which you should for sure, and add some of these a little more off the, uh, the usual beaten path leafy greens. You're going to get all the calcium you need. What's wrong with eating fish? A lot of people say it's healthy. Yeah, fish has a healthy reputation uh, in part because of observations around Okinawa, which is an island and uh, there was much more fish eaten than any other animal product. And there was good health and longevity. And the Mediterranean diet, again, around a big sea and a lot of fish, um, where there were, of course, there were animal products, but there was more seafood available because uh, the proximity to the sea 
and the generally good health in people following the Mediterranean diet. But if you really stand back, so there's associations. I'm unaware of a randomized study, fish versus non-fish on some important health outcome. Um, it's you know the language of cardiology for sure, two servings of fish a week to get your omega-3 in place of red meat. I mean, it may be a better choice than red meat. It's definitely a better choice than fried food, unless you're frying your fish. It's a better choice than processed fast food, uh, you know, a uh, McBurger of any type. But is it actually healthy? And, and we know there's other ways to get our omega-3 from our seeds and our nuts and our leafy greens. Um, there's other ways to get the protein from our beans and our nuts and our seeds and our greens and our chlorella and all kinds of plant sources. Um, but is it actually heart friendly? And there's very little direct data. There is actually an animal study, I'm pretty sure it's a mouse study that looked at the degree of plaque or atherosclerosis in the aorta. And they fed these mice fish-free mouse food and fish-enriched mouse food. There actually was more plaque in the aorta in the fish-enriched mouse child. Now we don't have a human study that's similar. And finally, fish in 2021, 2022 and beyond, they are known as what are called bioaccumulators. If you wanna find mercury, go look in fish flesh. If you wanna find DDT, PCBs, BPA, fish flesh and fish fat, unfortunately accumulate these environmental toxins more than most other foods. So I have dozens, if not hundreds of patients that are fish eaters and their blood mercury level, which is another test I do routinely, is sky high. And if I don't call them, the state board of medicine sometimes will call my patients. We got a report that your mercury level is 40 and we wanna know if you're in some trouble or somebody's poisoning you or you're working at a job or you're at risk. And their answer is no, I just like tuna wraps. <laughs> I uh, literally have to you know, detox them from tuna wraps and get them back to a hummus wrap and use some other methods and their mercury level goes down. So it's a real risk because mercury is bad for kidneys, blood pressure, brain, um, heart health. It, it's, it's a serious toxin that plant-based eaters are just going to be exposed to much less. What do you recommend for someone who has gastrointestinal problems? Well, you know, that's... Um, a big issue. I mean, I, I really, again, since it's not my main focus, we'll educate them that good old Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut and gut health is important. And gut health is partly the type of food you put in your gut. It's the quality of the food. Is it uh, higher in pesticides and chemicals and additives and food coloring? Even our medications, shockingly, you take a over-the-counter heartburn pill, or you take a prescription drug, generic or name brand, and 38 of the 40 ingredients are additives and lactose and wheat and corn, things that people are allergic to. So lots of things go in our gut, whether they're coming from food, whether they're coming actually from even uh, prescription drugs and medications, you should read the labels and do research on your own uh, medications if you're taking some over-the-counter or prescription um, so I try and upgrade and get people to understand, let's get rid of dairy because dairy often aggravates the gut. Let's lower saturated fat, which is good by cheese and egg yolks and meats and coconut oil, because there is some data that high saturated fat diets do injure the lining of the gut and allow what people often call leaky gut or uh, toxins to enter our body that cause widespread inflammation and replace them with whole food plants of a variety of colors uh, spices uh, of every kind except salt that naturally all tend to support and heal the lining of the gut. A lot of variety. There's data that pomegranates, for example, and how many people can raise their hands that I had pomegranates today, but you can buy bags of frozen pomegranate kernels. You can always get uh, a bottle of unsweetened pomegranate juice. Or your grocery store might have pomegranates for sale, which are messy, but they're delicious. Uh, pomegranates are unbelievably restorative to the lining of the gut and uh, a good choice, but so are a large variety of whole food plant-based uh, choices. Should we eat whole food plant-based fats like raw seeds, raw nuts, raw olives, and 
avocados or should we limit them? Um, you've mentioned flax. What about flax and olive and hemp oil? There is certainly, you know, a variety of opinions about is the optimal plant diet naturally low in fat or is there room to include some of even whole foods, as you mentioned, avocados, which are very high in fiber, but have a lot of monounsaturated fat um, and are very popular, of course, or nuts and seeds, which can be very, you know, nutrient dense, a lot of calories of which a lot will be from fat, but not exclusively. There's a lot of fiber and there's a lot of nutrition in nuts and seeds, of course, um, but everything can be done to excess um, and oils. And you know, for survival and general health, we know that there are high fat diets that are healthy in the island of Crete, where there was, though it's not considered a blue zone, but it's part of the Mediterranean diet basin and a lot of research. It was a very high fat diet, largely from extra virgin olive oil. And traditionally they had very low chronic disease rates when they were studied before McDonald's and KFCs came in. Um, and then there was Okinawa that had a naturally very low fat diet and had pretty similar health to the people in Crete. So the human body can accommodate. Um, certainly you can eat a variety of ways and get to the point of childbearing and reproduce yourself. But if you're really interested in minimal medications, staying away from the medical system uh, and having the optimal health, um, there are a variety of paths, and I don't think it's resolved, is the plant-based diet with nuts, seeds, avocados, and olives uh, equal, inferior, or superior um, to the whole, whole food plant-based diet that's very low in fat naturally, um, just from the foods without anything added. Uh, if it's weight loss, weight loss is favored by avoiding those foods to excess. Um, the strongest data of using plant diets to lose weight are really the ones that are, as Dr. Neil Bernard calls, low or no oil, avoiding excess fats. And when you get to heart disease patients, my field, from 1950, Dr. Lester Morrison's or Mr. Pritikin's or Dr. Ornish or Dr. Esselstyn, uh, with the exception of Joel Furman's experience, which is a real experience that's published in the science, uh, most of the data has been using whole food plant diets for heart patients that are naturally low in fat. So when we talk about reversing blockage, as is demonstrated in research studies, the design has always been to keep the fat content of the diet low. And until we do a different study where we maybe compare plant diets that are very low in fat to plant diets that have healthy but higher levels of fat from olives and avocados and nuts and seeds. For the severe heart patient, I teach uh, get the low fat version of a plant diet. What's been the response in the medical world to your study showing how diet can dramatically reduce or eliminate heart disease? Ig ignoring it year after year after year, questioning it. Um, and sometimes just complete unfamiliarity. I mean, go grab a cardiologist and say, who's Dean Ornish, who's Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, who's Nathan Pritikin? And uh, I think there's a good chance that more than half would say, I don't know who those people are and I've never watched Forks Over Knives, which is sad because as uh, some of the listeners and viewers know, it's as far back as 2010, Medicare and Medicaid approved you've had a heart attack, you want to optimize your health, you want to go to cardiac rehab, which is an exercise program, um, but you want to do more than the average patient and you really want to have a great outcome, that they approve for payment a Pritikin cardiac rehab program that teaches plant-based diets to heart patients, an Ornish cardiac rehab program, and that there are dozens, if not more than 100 of these um, centers available Unfortunately, only for people who already had an event, a heart attack, a bypass, a stent, even those at risk for transplant, not for the person that's working to avoid needing a bypass. That person has to still kind of do this on their own, but insurance will pay for it. And physicians don't know that, that in their own community, they can send a patient or send themselves and 
the weight of the data is so impressive that insurance companies actually will pay for a program that people learn how to cook and how to shop and how to manage stress and how to do some fitness and yoga at home in addition to just the standard rehab. So um, we just keep chipping away. And I think the newer generation of younger residents and physicians are a little bit more aware and a little bit more open-minded to it because the culture in general has been talking more about plant-based diets in the last decade than when some of the senior physicians grew up. They don't even, I mean, I read the notes from chiefs of cardiology at universities that I share patients with. No questions about diet, no advice about diet. It's not even on the menu. And I, I hear from patients that tell me, when I asked my endocrinologist about my thyroid and what diet, the answer was, I don't recommend diet. I only recommend prescription drugs. Frustrating, common, we got a long way to go. What affects sex drive and how do you keep it strong in your 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s? Or is that not realistic? No, it is the goal to have good libido and good performance uh, throughout your entire life and hopefully a very long and healthy life. There is no reason, and there are plenty of examples of uh, you know people in their 80s and 90s that are still enjoying active sex lives and you know, successful in terms of the mechanics of it all. Uh, however, um, all the inputs that are dragging our health down from our processed food diet, high in salt and fat and chemicals and additives, uh, to the obesity, to the diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol, development of cardiovascular disease, as well as a lot of environmental factors we didn't worry so much about 50 years ago, the quality of the water we drink, the air we drink, the lotions and uh, other things we put on our body that absorb through our skin. Um, it's by age 50, 50% 50 of men are having erectile dysfunction in a serious way. My cardiology practice is very much involved in sexual health. It's a medical topic that uh, men want to talk about. Sometimes women want to talk about uh, in terms of their own uh, libido or their partner's libido. Uh, it destroys people's lives, their confidence. Uh, be a single guy in your early 50s with severe erectile dysfunction and try and date. Uh, it really, these are conversations I have with patients. So, you know, as always, the best plan is prevention. Keep your weight down, get your fitness, don't smoke, eat healthy, keep your arteries clean, get your arteries checked, get your labs checked, and you will likely not develop the problem. Um, if you're already in a state where you have disease, it's one more motivation. And I think it's a very strong motivator, even more sometimes than avoiding bypass or dementia. Um, that guys are pretty desperate and I will include women in the mix too, to try and regain their full sexual health. It's very, very um, achievable to improve, uh, diminish sexual drive, diminish sexual performance and get back in the saddle fully. And we don't talk about it. You know, it's also clearly a risk that there's heart disease in the patient with sexual dysfunction and that has to be addressed. But once that's cleared up, you have or don't have heart disease. And sometimes it's obvious from the history. Sometimes you got to do that heart calcium scan and lab work. But once you've been through there, you just got to emphasize. And of all the foods that have been studied that most support good sexual health, actually fruit in a number of studies comes up over and over. And there's a fruit phobia out there. People think fruit causes diabetes, uh, which it doesn't. Uh, fruit juice isn't a great choice. And soda pop's not a great choice. But eat your apple, you're not gonna get diabetes from an apple. And you're also gonna get better sexual health from an apple. So uh, be sure in your daily activity, you're getting two or three servings of fruit in your diet, at least. What are lectins? Author Stephen Gundry says to avoid many whole plant foods because they have lectins. Yeah, uh, Dr. Gundry, um, has made himself into a big commercial success by twisting science to an extreme and then telling a story that's very compelling because he's a very good storyteller, but stories are for children's books, not for uh, adult consumption. And sometimes it's hard to separate it. 
Um, lectins are found, they're a chemical group found in almost all plant foods and animal foods and throughout nature. There are many beneficial effects. Uh, some cancer treaters use lectins to treat cancer because of its activity to restore health back. That's called mistletoe, which of course is the famous Christmas uh, green. Uh, it actually is used, it's a lectin. Um, however, in the plant-based diet, uh, beans and legumes are quite high in these chemical structures called lectins. Uh, Dr. Gundry, based on very little science and certainly very little human science, and certainly none of his own published research, created a fear by starting to call in 2017, killer lectins, and actually telling the story that if you eat five raw red kidney beans, you will die because you shouldn't be eating raw kidney beans. You will get an upset stomach if you eat raw kidney beans. You're not going to die. But he created such a fear about all this that people started to shy away um, uh, from. And of course, he came up with a uh, rather expensive supplement called the lectin blocker to tell the story that you are in so much danger, you need to buy an expensive supplement to protect you. That is fanciful. I mean, we know from cultures around the world, we know from scientific studies, you know, legumes, beans, peas, lentils, properly prepared, pressure cook them, buy them from reliable sources that are canned, but pressure cooked, soak your beans adequately, cook your beans. Who wants to eat raw beans anyways? I'm not aware of any culture. It'd be a tough, tough hummus to make if your chickpeas uh, weren't properly soaked and cooked. But nonetheless, if you do all that, we all know those are the foods that lower cholesterol, provide good gut health, seem to suggest longevity patterns. So he created a ruckus that still is ongoing. He shifted a little now and he's scaring the public now for the last year and a half that apples are destroying the health of America. Um, and he literally advises now not to eat apples, which is a big uh, horse pucky. But so I, I just ignore Santa Claus that's what he looks like. And he, you know, tells good stories. I'm trying to get him a job as a Santa Claus and a Neiman Marcus in Los Angeles. What can you do to prevent dementia, Alzheimer's and memory loss? Alzheimer's, memory loss are all big issues. People are very scared of it, particularly if there's a family member that's had it. If you've had the experience of watching a previously vibrant loved one, you know, deteriorate or die, uh, tragic. Um, we're still looking, you know, for the perfect solution. But we know that a lot of dementia is nutritional. A lot of dementia is vascular blood vessel. The same efforts we make to protect our heart and the rest of our arteries work for the brain. So when we avoid high saturated fat, high processed food diets, fast food diets, vending machine diets, carry in fried foods, uh, that will tend to raise our blood sugar, blood pressure, blood cholesterol when we avoid those so that we hopefully achieve more normal blood pressure, blood cholesterol, uh, body weight, uh, blood sugar. Uh, we're improving our brain health. Um, eating high nutrition foods that are not excessive in calories, which are fruits and vegetables, beans, peas, and whole grains. And uh, many studies like the Chicago Healthy Aging Project, it's called you know, the, it was the produce that prevents dementia. It wasn't the meats and the cheeses and certainly not the fast food or processed food. Um, you want to get exercise. You want to get sleep. There's lots of data now. Seven to eight hours a night compared to less than five is a very brain important habit. Don't smoke. Avoid excess alcohol. Keep active. Keep engaged in life. Keep learning. Even if you've retired, read books, watch videos that are educational, learn a new language, learn a new skill, wood making or table tennis or uh, some other activity that requires a little high hand coordination. Um, omega-3 is a debate. If you take extra omega-3, which can come from plant sources, and some people of course do it from fish or fish oil, does that support uh, brain health? There's data that it does. Um, carotenoids, that's a group of nutrients uh, like carrots, carotenoids, like the oranges, the cantaloupes, the sweet potatoes. Um, they are very good for eye health, but they seem to be very good for brain health too, whether you get them from foods or you get them uh, as a supplement. 
Um, but as again, as Ben Franklin nailed, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. There is no recognized um, reversal of advanced dementia. We hope there will be, but at this point, it's still speculative. Early memory loss may be reversible. Drop the weight. There's a psychiatrist in Los Angeles, well-known Dr. Daniel Amen, who uses the term dinosaur syndrome. The bigger your body, the smaller your brain. When they do studies of people's brains by MRI, and you know, we're talking about significant obesity. So you want to work hard, and it is hard, to try and maintain you know, the healthiest weight you can with the healthiest natural lifestyle around you. Why do you say that beans are good for our brains? Beans are good for our brains for a couple of reasons. Uh, if we're eating beans, we're not eating French fries, hopefully. Uh, so we are taking a food that's rich in fiber, rich in nutrients, naturally low in salted fats, doesn't uh, raise blood sugar much. In fact, uh, beans are very good food for people trying to avoid or reverse diabetes. So it's what we're eating in place of some of the foods that might uh, not be optimal for brain health uh, by avoiding uh, excess saturated fat and cheeses and meats and fried food and processed food. Um, I'm not aware of a particular nutrient in beans that just say that's the magic. We sometimes talk about blueberries having a brain supportive, a super rich antioxidant profile that helps um, brain health, a turmeric, a spice that's very anti-inflammatory and seems to be supporting good brain health. These are things we commonly talk about. Rosemary, you wanna add a little brain friendly spice to your soup you're making today. You wanna to put in a lot of rosemary. There's a famous little village in Italy. I visited it about three years ago, south of Naples called Acciaroli and they have excellent health to old age. Um, and they are the rosemary capital of Italy. There's rosemary in everything. And Shakespeare said 500 years ago, rosemary helps your memory and science actually supports it based on analyzing what's in there. So I would put rosemary on my beans. I don't think I'd put blueberry on my beans. I might put turmeric on my beans, uh, but I would keep eating beans. How do we know if the benefits of a medical treatment or test outweigh the risks and who should we listen to? Yeah, tough, tough, tough. And that's where second opinions for elective procedures is something I write about, something I strongly encourage. Um, I'll give you an example. I was trained and had performed thousands and thousands of heart catheterizations, poke the groin, the femoral artery, poke the wrist, the radial artery, thread a little tube up to the heart, inject dye into the heart arteries and then get the little puncture to stop bleeding. Um, generally a safe study, but there is the real risk of bleeding and kidney damage and blood vessel damage. And there are people that have strokes or die from a simple outpatient heart catheterization. Well, that's no longer the only way to get accurate information on heart arteries if you feel it's needed. And I'm not talking in an emergency setting where somebody's in the midst of a heart attack, but I'm talking about outpatient scheduled. One of my patients was told six weeks ago, you need a heart catheterization and it was scheduled you know, six to eight weeks later. Well, there's no emergency if you're having a heart catheterization scheduled in eight weeks. There are CT scans. If, there, if we absolutely need to know heart anatomy just through a simple IV, and there's you know, nearly no risk to that, they can give the iodine through the IV. It'll reach the heart arteries. You get the same or actually more sophisticated analysis of the presence and degree of blockage. And you have to be concerned about whether you have an allergy to iodine, whether your kidneys will clear the iodine, but you've eliminated all that other significant risk. And I encourage my people, you know, wait on the invasive procedure. Um, there is no guaranteed safe procedure from a colonoscopy to an endoscopy to invasive procedures for sure. They're generally safe and they're generally low risk, but it's fair to question, do I really need this? So a second opinion, if you can find somebody willing to, in my field, look at the stress test, look at the electrocardiogram, take a history, no data like the ischemia study that showed uh, medication, low saturated fat diet and exercise did as well as bypass surgery. Well, if you got that in your back pocket, you got to ask the question, why am I having a heart catheterization, an invasive test? Why can't I adopt 
the pattern they used in that research study, or why can't I have the CT angiogram and avoid somebody threading a tube through my blood vessels and taking some risks? So it just takes education and courage to ask the question or say, I don't want that. And it can be overdone. I have patients that don't want procedures and they actually probably need them. Um, a lot of people avoid colonoscopy, but now there's a stool test called Cologuard that is at least a reasonable substitute for many people. But you know, so I don't urge people to stay away from the medical community, but question procedures. How do you prevent against osteoporosis and broken bones? Yeah, bone health is important. Certainly, if we're looking for good health in our 70s, 80s, and 90s, we don't want vertebral fractures, rib fractures. We don't want to fall and have a hip fracture. These can all be both debilitating and actually lethal as we get older. Um, so, you know, regular fitness and exercise to maintain your muscle mass. Um, a lot of weight bearing exercise. So, swimming is awesome, but you want to also walk. You want to also uh, may use a rebounder or a treadmill so that your body weight is there. There is some data that wearing a weighted vest during exercise doesn't have to be excessive to hurt yourself. Puts a little more weight on your bones when you're exercising and build stronger bones. You want to have adequate nutrition and the vitamin D, the vitamin K2, a spectrum of what are called micronutrients that generally come from food like Brazil nuts to get that selenium as an example. Um, and you can test for it. You can do, <coughs> excuse me, you know, bone density testing. It's an industry, uh, bone density testing and injectable drugs and expensive drugs for bone health. Some of them have serious side effects. You're giving a drug for bone health and it degrades the quality of your jaw bone health. You end up with sort of a oral emergency, uh, you know, you have to read and question and say, I, I think I'll try a lifestyle approach to my bone health, <clears throat> add in some bone supportive nutrients. How do you prevent arthritis? Arthritis is an important topic because it is common and it certainly can degrade the quality of life of a lot of people. <clears throat> the, some arthritis is, you know, we, classified as degenerative, uh, the common osteoarthritis, degenerative arthritis, although we know that that is also an inflammatory process. And there are data, it does respond to whole food plant diets. Um, it's not gonna alter necessarily the bone structure, but the inflammation around the bone structure can be diminished. And then, you know, other arthritis uh, is related to autoimmune conditions, of course, rheumatoid arthritis, and others that are less common. And a lot of that is gut health again. And we now have reasonable data that autoimmune conditions, which may be triggered by the environment, may be triggered by genetics, may be triggered by our food choices, do also respond, sometimes mildly, sometimes dramatically, to clean whole food plant-based diets. There's no research on that. We didn't have that 15 years ago for conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. So again, prevent is the highest goal and then treat and try and reverse is the next level of care. And you want super clean, super hydrated diets for arthritis. You want a um, lot of omega-3 from plant-based sources. So a lot of chia, a lot of flax, maybe a little bit more than the average person really uh, bathe somebody in anti-inflammatory and antioxidant rich foods. You know, a lot of run-of-the-mill arthritis is related to excess weight, uh, the back pain, the hips, the knees. So a person struggling with other diets, if they can successfully drop and maintain their weight with a whole food plant diet, uh, it's going to help their arthritis for sure. How do you protect your thyroid? Thyroid is that master gland that can so dominate someone's life and health. Some of it is environmental. Um, we know that in communities that are uh, low iodine belts, um, that you can get goiter quite commonly. And that's why making sure you're either eating foods that have iodine in them, like sea vegetables and kelp, 
taking supplements or at least measuring your iodine status, a little bit of iodinized salt if you're not struggling with high blood pressure are reasonable choices. Um, there's very few reports of harming your thyroid from cruciferous vegetables like kale. Uh, you would have to eat pounds and pounds and pounds of crucifers a day. Uh, you know, we like variety in our diet. We don't need excess in any one nutrient. Uh, there's just no reason to eat five pounds of bok choy a day. Uh, it's just not a, a decent plan. I mean, bok choy is great, but move it around a little bit. Um, so there is some data from the Adventist Health Study that people that answered that I eat a vegan diet had less thyroid disease than people that answered I eat other styles of diet, standard American diet. So I think we've got that one on our list as uh, to some degree preventable. You know, there's still causes. There's autoimmune thyroid disease, uh, both the hypo and the hyper Graves kind. And, you know, we don't completely understand what triggers that reaction of antibodies that destroy the gland. But um, so how do I try and optimize health? I test, I test nutrients. I emphasize clean whole food diets. Um, there are some integrative approaches to thyroid health. There's some data, you know, a few people respond to a gluten-free version of a plant diet. I don't generally advocate that unless there's celiac disease, but there's a little data for the thyroid family that might be something they do short term. What impact does a whole food plant-based diet have on preventing chronic kidney disease? I think one of the more exciting topics in the last 10 years is actual data that um, we've always known that high protein diets in people with advanced kidney disease could be problematic. They have trouble clearing the protein, might even worse than the rate that their kidneys deteriorate. But how about we don't just watch the deterioration? How about we try and reverse the process? So there is now growing data and a small but growing number of nephrologists that are on social media and maybe more importantly, actually writing scientific articles, doing some scientific research, that because plant-based diets naturally tend to have more normal blood sugars, blood pressures, blood cholesterols, um, are often lower in protein, which is actually healthy. We've bought into the idea that we need so much protein and the consequence kind of can damage our kidneys. So you'll get all the protein you need if you eat fruits, vegetables, grains, and legumes, but you're getting them in a plant-based source that over and over has been shown to be more kidney friendly. And there are cases now, some are anecdotal, some are in the literature of small or massive improvements in kidney function by adopting a whole food plant-based diet. There's a Facebook community that particularly teaches this and they have you know, so many, I'd call them anecdotal, but authentic um, cases. I used to have you know, this level of kidney function and 12 months later in my plant diet, you know, my kidney doctor doesn't understand why, but look how much better my kidney function is. That's very exciting. What impact does eating a whole food plant-based diet have on animals, climate change, and the environment? You know, there's there's a small noisy group that keep claiming, uh, you know, meat production, chicken production, egg production isn't the problem, that we're killing animals when we grow soybeans or edamame, and, you know, these bad vegans are destroying the animals and the environment. It's, there's always going to be a little dissent, because for some reason, food discussions just get people backed up against the wall and their traditional cultures and habits and upbringing or their business. But when you look at the big picture, whether you're talking, not necessarily my favorite group, but the World Health Organization, the United Nations, the USDA, big group in Europe last year, Eat Lancet, or maybe it was 2019. And when you get a panel of scientists that are qualified that sit down, you know, uh, water use, forest destruction, greenhouse gas, production, CO2 production, you know, a significant, not entire part of it is raising animals, uh, uh, clearing forests for grazing lands and uh, production of corn and wheat and soy just to feed factory raised animals. 
for the growing lust for meats around the world. Unfortunately, the uh, United States has had their time, but now in Asia and uh, other countries in Africa, there's, there's more desire for meats and it's driving more need to uh, cut down more of the Amazon and put more animals uh, in cruel circumstance to provide that feed. So yeah, there's no doubt, you know, and uh, intelligent people who do nothing but study this say that by 2050, when we may have 10 billion people on the planet Earth, we're going to need to be much more plant-based or much more factory um, and uh, lab-based meat production uh, and not the traditional model of factory farms and destruction of forests. What is a food desert and what can we do about people who live near them? Yeah, you know, I'm in Detroit and we have a range of economic and uh, availability of uh, fresh foods and grocery stores, uh, too many liquor stores where a lot of people buy their cans of food. Uh, you're not going to find much fresh there. And there's risk to the a small grocery store or liquor store owner to have fresh produce because if it doesn't sell, you know, the can of beans can sit there a long time. The zucchini is going to be thrown out at a loss. So they, these are challenges um, and they're being addressed with people of low income being able to use their uh, supplemental income, uh, you know, and get double the amount of food if they choose produce versus fast food or soda pop or cookies. Um, programs like that, you know, sometimes it's free boxes of fruits and vegetables from uh, a faith-based uh, kitchen or a medical kitchen that's trying, to, and then rarely a hospital system, a few hospital systems that have farmhouses and gardens and are actually providing some produce to the community. They're wonderful, wonderful situations. And part of it is still just education. I mean, uh, you know, the fast food industry is a real travesty that you can walk out with a bag and calories, maybe under five dollars, uh, but you know, promoting disease, um, poor nutritional content, and the at least the impression that it'd be much more expensive to go to the grocery store and buy foods uh, that are of a higher quality and have to prepare. So there's the need to educate people: how do you make? a simple stew, a simple soup, a simple casserole, a uh, simple breakfast, simple lunch. Um, and then what to buy, how to buy big bags of frozen produce that is on discount, how to buy big bags of um, legumes and maybe learn to soak your own big bags of rice and learn how to you know, boil your own and uh, how to have spices that are relatively inexpensive. And you know just how to make five meals for the family a uh, breakfast, a lunch, and a few dinners that are inexpensive and uh, are pleasing. So we've got a ways to go on all that, but it's doable. What impact does a whole food plant-based diet have on aging? Aging is a really interesting topic. Aging isn't considered a disease. A lot of experts think aging should be considered a disease because there's healthy aging and then there's aging associated with all kinds of chronic illnesses. And a term called health span where you're aging but enjoying good health. Uh, and you can have an excellent health span or a poor health span. You can live to 90, but 25 years of your life are involved in the medical system of poor quality. It's not an optimal goal most of us strive for. Uh, you know, by avoiding heart disease, by lowering your risk of some cancers, lowering your risk of diabetes, lowering your risk of high blood pressure, a whole food plant-based diet attacks many of the biggest risks of aging and aging becoming a real struggle for health um, by avoiding heart disease, diabetes, cancers, some of the other chronic conditions, we talked about kidney disease. Um, we don't have a lot of evidence and data. We have some from uh, some prospective aging studies like in Chicago, that when you switch out processed vending machines, saturated fat rich and sugar rich foods for the whole foods, uh, it appears that people do better, live longer. Um, the Blue Zones experience, the Adventist experience, that the best longevity appears to be in those that are closest to whole food plant-based eaters. So we, you know, and then just understanding biochemistry and 
all. Dr. Walter Longo at University of Southern California talks about the five pillars of longevity and looking at basic science and epidemiology and randomized studies and um, other clinical parameters. And when you apply all that to whole food plant-based, we should have a good chance of living longer with a plant-rich diet. There always are these heroes out there. Dr. Ansel Keys, who lived almost 101. Uh, Dr. Elliot, but he wasn't vegan, but he was very vegetable forward diet. Dr. Elliot Warsham, the famous heart surgeon in Loma Linda, who lived to well over 100 and you know, practiced cardiac surgery till his mid 90s. Um, there's a famous epidemiologist still alive right now, Jeremiah Stamler, who's about to have his 101st birthday. But he's been a professor of nutrition and very plant forward Mediterranean diet. And a friend of mine, Henry Blackburn, who's turning 97 and plays, um, uh, I think it's the, the flute in a band still at age 97. I mean, these people who've been studying nutrition and understand goodbye processed food, hello fresh food, hello lots of garden and produce foods uh, having exceptional longevity. It's kind of nice to see that. It, it only suggests, it doesn't prove but hopefully we'll see you, me, Dr. Bernard, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Ornish, uh, Dr. Firm, and many others lived 105 in good health. And we can add our names to the list. Why was it important for you to come speak at the Real Truth About Health Conference? I am wanting to stop, slow down, take a break, learn to paint or some other activity. But there is such a need. And I can't do those things uh, now. There's still such a need. I'm an active clinician. I talk to patients. I talk to doctors. I talk to other people in the health field. And we've seen a lot of progress in spreading the news and doing the science and getting the word out that um, we can, uh, to follow a quote from Dr. Michael Greger, the, one of the greatest secrets in medicine is that under the right situation, the body can learn to heal itself. I also think you can extend it to say one of the greatest secrets in medicine is that under the right circumstances, we can get the body to never get disease and not even have a need to heal itself and reverse existing disease, but not develop them in the first place. Even a bigger, you know, big, scary, hairy goal there of making heart disease, diabetes, cancer, arthritis, brain disease, kidney disease, relatively uncommon. I, I actually think if we could just embrace you know, warp speed nutrition, warp speed plant-based diet. So there's still so much work to do uh, and to speak to audiences that understand this already and to speak to audiences that have really not heard it yet. And uh, so we need a whole army doing that. And I don't mind being one of the soldiers uh, of which, you know, this conference is an excellent, excellent format to battle ignorance and spread good, solid information. Well, we thank you that you're, you're a part of it. And uh, thank you for all your meaningful work and for your time today as well. Thank you very much. And I apologize for a couple of coughs there. A uh, uh, little, little green juice went down the wrong pipe, but you have a, a good day. And thank you to the audience for listening. Thanks, Dr. Khan. Be well.